Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Laura. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Laura. I want to thank Paul, wherever the heck he is, for getting me here. Um, Good grief. Okay. Um, before I start with my story, I just wanted just to tell you how I got to this meeting today. Um, because I wake up and I do the, I do the, you know, the 10th and 11th, and it says that we're supposed to wake up, review our plans with God. And, um, and also in the third step, that we're supposed to be God's agent, God's employee. And in this past two, almost two years, I've really brushed up my third and my, 10th and 11th step. And so I'm not just waking up and saying, oh, it's a good day, man. I got through it. Caused no harm. This is all I need, you know. Um, and so I ask, you know, ask for an intuitive thought or something, you know, whatever. And one day I, I go to a listen and I used to go to listen and learn on a Sunday morning up in Palmer and good recovery, solid. You know, I get a lot out of that meeting. And this thought came to me, and it was no suggestion from a sponsor. It wasn't. Nobody told me. I didn't hear anyone share it at a meeting. Get out of that meeting. You need to go to a newcomer's meeting again. And um, But I don't want to. You know, I, I want, I, I'm getting something out of that meeting. And it was just this little thought. And so I started going um, back to West Bethlehem New Beginnings meeting on a Sunday afternoon. And, you know, there's like 60 to 70 newcomers. It's, you know, it's very, you know, there's a lot of newcomers there. And, but I clearly could hear that that's where I was supposed to be. And so I went and, um, I was, I was on my way there the one morning or the one afternoon and I was burned up, man. I was burned up. Um, I had, I, we have a baby who's he's like a year and a half at the time and, uh, he wasn't sleeping through the night and he, I was up with him a lot and my husband had gotten laid off couple months before that and I was supposed to go part part time at my job and my husband that's you know long story short I can't go part time I have to work full time now because he's you know he got laid off and so I'm burned up man the baby's saying daddy you know that's all he's saying daddy 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 I'm getting up with him and I'm so I'm praying on the way to the meeting I'm like you know come on God shoot me something here what am I supposed to do and so the chair of the meeting got up And he was burned up, man, because nobody's signing up to make coffee. Nobody. And he let us have it, man. And he walked across the room with his little clipboard, and he gave it to us during the meeting. And I had prayed before, you know, on the way there, God, give me something. And you know how they say, God, remove my difficulties, that victory, uh, uh, my creator, I'm willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. And then remove only the difficulties that stand in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Well, his resentment and uh, fear of, I don't know if he was afraid that the meeting would fold or whatever, he'd have to make the coffee. That difficulty, it was so clear to me, like, I'll make the coffee, man. Like, that's what it is. So I'm like, that's exactly what it is. Because I know what service does because I've done this long enough to know um, that when I do service, my problems are not solved. They just disappear. And so I swear to you, within three weeks of taking this coffee, the coffee commitment there. And it's a very newcomery kind of thing to do. You know, I've been sober. It'll be 14 years at the end of the month. And I don't want to take newcomers jobs, God. You know what I mean? Like I want to save them because that's what they got to do. And, um, and it was perfect. And he, my, I'm telling you, I didn't even start making the coffee because then Chuck, if he's here, stole my freaking month in January. And so And then I had to do it in February, but I chaired the meeting, and honest to God, my son starts saying, Mommy, within three weeks, he starts sleeping through the night, and I would never have been there. I would never have been at that meeting if I didn't have a baby that was crying, a husband that made me mad, if I didn't do the third and the tenth and eleventh step, and I never would have saw Paul there, because I hadn't seen Paul at a meeting in a very long time. And so I go over to Paul, and I say, Paul, Liberty Bell's coming up. I want Bob D. to come speak from Las Vegas, and I think it'll be good for him to come on Monday right after the weekend. And he goes, well, how about you speak there? And I go, oh. you know, and, and I took a coffee commitment, and now I get to speak at feet first, so I just thought that was pretty cool. Um, but anyway, who would have thought? A humble service position, and, and, I, and I got to come here. I mean, that's pretty cool. So um, I'm just really, I'm really grateful my um, thank Thanks for having me here. Um, like I said, my sobriety date is March 25th, 
1998. And um, I love this program. This program has saved my life. It has, it has, I can't even say it saved my life. It gave me, it gave me a life. And so just talk a little bit about, you know, the beginning, because I was always taught to talk about the alcoholism, not the alcohol. And it's pretty, it's pretty boring. I didn't drink for a long time, like some of you guys did. Um, and I got sober at a very early age, and, and I'm just really grateful for that. But I did grow up in alcoholism. My dad was an alcoholic, still is an alcoholic. So we had the typical alcoholic, you know, no money, mother crying. She hates him. I hate her. If she just leaves him alone, we'd all be fine. What is wrong with her? He's so fun, and he's so loving. And and we had, um, you know, typical throwing him out on 22, and he'd be drunk, staggering in the lanes, and we'd be crying. Um and I just thought, God, get off his case, man. Like, she was just such a witch. And um, and it really, it, and, and I mean, I say that now today, but it was really painful, you know, growing up in that. We had rats in our basement. There was never any money. He always spent the money. Um, I grew up at Pinochle poker parties where the smoke was so thick you couldn't even see your, your cousin next to you. You're like this because they're smoking so much. Um, and it always ended the same way. One would always cry, the aunt or the uncle. Or the, they would start a fight over the poker or the pinochle, and that's how it always ended. And then you always had the drunk uncle or aunt, I love you, I love you, your mom loves you. And then my, it, and my mother would always be angry because my dad never wanted to leave. So it, you could guarantee it was always going to end the same way. So that would be something that I would play. That was one of my cards that I wouldn't be like this if they weren't like that. And um, so I, my first drunk, I was 14 or 15, I had four vodka and orange juice, and I had four Heineken. And I had always known that you do not drink beer because it makes you stupid. And it, my uncles acted ridiculous. I am telling you, it was the most pathetic thing that you could see a grown man act. And so I knew that that's what went wrong that night. And I woke up a couple hours later on some uh, concrete porch with my head on the pillow, be- me- meaning the step, looking up at the moon. And I just remember it was the most beautiful moon I had ever seen. I mean, ever. It was like I had lived a life to see this moon, man. I mean, I could appreciate it. I didn't hate anyone, you know. It was fabulous. Um, And from then on, um, you know, I had fun, did the little teenage thing um, in my junior year. Um, I will say as a child, I was overweight, um, and I ate a lot to, you know, comfort, you know, growing up in the alcoholism. and come my junior year, I decided, well, I'm done with this. And uh, I ended up losing 80 pounds in about six months and got very ill, um, you know, with not then having problems with eating disorders, anorexia. Um, and it was good because when you lose a lot of weight, you can drink and you can feel the, the effect quite quickly. My dad was always the supplier of the liquor because I always made him feel bad, like... <laughs> You're going to do what I say, buddy, because he's trying to make up for last week for never picking us up because he was so drunk. Um, and so he would buy vodka, and that was my thing. It never, nobody ever told me you shouldn't eat and drink. I just knew it. You just, you, why would you eat? You can't eat. At, it would be a waste of time. It never occurred to me. And I was the child that I loved soap operas because they always had liquor, you know, wine or whatever, champagne. And I drank out of brandy snifters when I was very, like, I would drink iced tea out of them. And I loved playing bartender downstairs while they were all drunk upstairs at my grandmother's. We'd get the old cigarette butts and we'd be sucking on them, you know, and they'd get the schnapps and everyone would be sniffing them, passing it around. And I loved it. And I thought it was glamorous and fun, but I would never be like them. My dad, the uncles and all of them. I would never be a loser like that. Um, and somehow junior year was fabulous and senior year it started to kind of turn on me. And so I drank cigarettes. I mean, drank them. I smoked them, and I drank vodka, and that's how I stayed thin, and um, and I got really crazy. And at that point, I was put on prescription pills and sent to a psych- psychiatrist. And um, my senior year, I could barely graduate. I missed 52 days, and they said, if you miss one more, you're done. And I thought, I don't know how I'm going to do this, because somehow the fun started dwindling, and... You know, they say women and drugs really make your speed up your bottom, and that's really, I think, kind of what happened with me. Um, and so what happened was I ended up graduating, and I thought, you know, if I just get away from them, I know I'll be fine, because I know it's them. It is. And so I probably should go to college, you know, like, right? I'm barely passing. I don't even know how I got accepted. So I went to Kutztown, and 
At Kutztown, I went, I spent $8,000 for one semester, and I went to two classes. And I remember walking into the psychology class and thinking, they all know you don't belong here. This is a joke. They all know. Like, you're, you're nothing. I, the, 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 that constant fear and tension, I was so gripped. I couldn't even, I couldn't even do anything. So I left, um, I left there and I went to my first, um, mental hospital. I don't know what you want to call it. Friends Hospital in Philadelphia. And I was there for 90 days. And back then you could go for a long time. Like insurance nowadays, they rip you off. But, um, back then you could go for like a long time. And, um, so I went and the first thing I did was I got a boyfriend and we popped pills that he had in his car and we did therapy and the therapy consisted of, it consisted of group therapy, which is always fun. If you've never done it, you should surely try it because that's when you get out your anger and you get good advice from other good people. And I was with people and they would say, pretend that is your mother. And I would and then they would charm, you know, chime in, and then we would role play. We would role play, and and somebody would always be mad and walking out, and it would just it wouldn't go well. And and we did, um, you know, I did all kinds of therapy. I did the music therapy, the art therapy. I've had my chakras balanced. I've had my cards read where they said something about a rat and a snake. Um, I've had I've done the. You know, the born again where you're falling over, slain in the spirit thing. I've walked with Buddhist monks in circles. I mean, I've done everything to over, to try and, you know, do something, um, and feel better. And they couldn't give what they didn't have. You know, they couldn't give me, they didn't know what was wrong with me. For God's sake, I had four mental diagnoses, one, um, being obsessive compulsive. I mean, there was a whole list of them and cross addicts or multi, I forget what they call it back then with, with all these addictions. And, um, from there, I went home, and I picked up right away, did the same thing. And I swore I would never. I would never have to go back there, and I would. And so when I, I went back for 60 days, and I would come home, and I would do the same thing. And so they let me back one more time. And I remember sitting with the one counselor, and he said, I said, what is this? You know, what are we going to do here? And he said, you're well, you're going to take pills for the rest of your life, and you're going to do therapy. You know, that's what people do that have your kinds of problems. And I'm like, oh, my God. And and I would watch people go for electric shock therapy there. The one girl just pulled her hair out during her sleep. And I thought, this is, I, there's something in me. I knew this was not me, man. I, I just, this just isn't me. And um, and we started, they sent you to AA meetings, and I thought, oh, my God. Oh, my God. You know? And so when they told me about, you know, being um, some clinically depressed and, and, you know, whatever, um, I got out from there. And when you're in there, you learn really sick things. You know, they'll tell you the little sick secrets. And so um, I would get out and do the same thing. And my parents hated me. And I was the child you did not want to have. And I would scream, I want to kill myself. And it was just a nightmare. And I was 19. And then I was 20. And, and I was just unemployable, couldn't go to school, couldn't get anything done. But I was always doing something. I was going to be somebody. And I couldn't believe my mom was so unjust to me when my brother is graduating West Point And she's treating me like I'm some loser. I mean, didn't she know I wanted to go to college and, like, be something? But I love the big book where it says, yeah, they judge you by your freaking actions, not your intentions. And, you know, that's really – but I, I wanted to be something. Like, she didn't see this. You know, she didn't see that about me. And um, I thought, you know what, I'm done with these people. And so I took a couple bottles of pills, and I'm like, I'm taking them. And that's what I learned in the rehab. Tylenol will dissolve your liver like an Alka-Seltzer. So I took a, bo- a bottle – couple, I don't know, over a hundred and some Prozac and some water and here's to you, mom, you know? And of course, um, went to the, called the psychiatrist. That was a good move and told them and I ended up at sacred, um, heart hospital with a tube down my nose and charcoal and vomiting and, and the first time experiencing that incomprehensible demoralization. And that is when they're laughing, you know, I'm there in the ER and they're cutting, you know, they cut your clothes off always. I don't know. But, um, and they're laughing and I hear these nurses and I'm half in and half out and they're just laughing like this is, you know, like what an idiot I am. And I remember waking up and seeing my mother and she was crying and she said, and I won't say the, the word, but she said, you make me freaking sick. And I couldn't disagree with her because I made myself sick, you know, like I was like, she's right on. And I just remember for the first time just closing my eyes and putting my head on the pillow because normally I would tell her about herself, you know, and I got out of there. Well, I didn't get out of there. I was then 302 up here to Quakertown, which used to be, yeah, Quakertown Hospital, which is now St. Luke's. And I had to go there. I was 302 and I had to be there. 
And nobody knew. Nobody knew what was wrong with me. Like they said, I have all these addictions and all this, but nobody really knew the real deal. And um, I was with the blonde lady who wore different wigs, and she was manic, and it was just insane. And I thought, this, something is wrong here. These are not, this isn't, you know, this isn't for me. And so I went on to, um, um, I got out of there and did the same thing. And I remember the one, a uh, couple weeks later, calling in the bathroom window, my mom just wailing at me, get, you know, and kicking me out. So I went to live. I had nowhere to go, and I went, because I'd burn every bridge. And I went to live with my friend's father, who doesn't speak English, but I had nowhere else to go. I rented a room from a state police officer. He said, no drinking, no men. That lasted a few, like, two months. And then I was kicked out of there. And then I called my mother in desperation. And I said, if you don't come and sign, co-sign for this apartment, I'm going to kill myself. I'm done. And she did. And that's when um, it got bad um, for me. Not initially, but um, by the time I was 22 years old, I was so paranoid. I was the kind of drinker that all of a sudden, get out of the house, like I think someone stole something from me. Um, I was very paranoid, so if there's any other paranoid alcoholics, I always like to know, because it's just for me, I, I was, I was swore that, you know, my neighbor next door drilled a hole through the closet and was looking at me, so I would move my clothes from side to side, and then I swore that the blind, that somebody was looking in. I don't know who, but somebody, so I would get up, walk outside, look in the blind, see if anybody could see in there. And this is what I would do. And I remember the final straw. I had my dad come to nail the window shut. And he brought two, because there's these big windows. And I swore somebody was going to get me. Um, and I don't know who that was. But um, um, I did start going to AA at that time. And I started hearing things like, um, you know, that I wasn't um, clinically depressed, that I was spiritually depressed. And that if I take, you know, this program um, and, and practice, I mean, the gift that I heard was that, oh, it's not them. It's you. Like, you're the problem. They never told me that in group therapy. I mean, and they never told me that you're going to die if you don't get rid of these resentments. No, they said, no, feel them. Feel them. And I've been feeling them for years. And nothing, it wasn't helping me. But they didn't know. Because they didn't, they just didn't know. And so when I heard that, you know, that was good news to me. Because that means, you know, that I could do something about me. And um, I got sober. I remember um, the, the night, and I was either going to, I was, you know, I, I was just done. And I called my, my, who would be my sponsor, and I came to AA, and I was 22, and I thought, oh, dear God, like, come on. Um, the first thing I did was I got a boyfriend, and they said no dating. And I for a year, that was the little rule, and I said, well, I have six months, you know. He has three years. That's nine months if you add them. And all these people are divorced. I'm 22, man. Like, they screwed up their lives, but I have one ahead of me. And so that was the most psychotic relationship I have ever had in my entire life. When I was, I had better drinking relationships that lasted longer than I did, so that one. The police were involved. I had a PFA against this guy. I sat in front of a judge at 2.30 in the morning when he told me and my mother he would, I won't say the word, freaking kill me and her. And I remember the next day I called him to tell him I'm sorry. You want to talk about soul sickness and wanting to fill a hole with something other than God or this program. And I remember when they said, get rid of them, get rid of your sleazy waitress girlfriends. And I thought, oh, how unfair. Like, these are my friends, you know. And I just, I had no idea, though, that God was going to give me an army full of women, an army full of people. Um, and I took my sponsor's suggestion. She said no dating for a year. I said, no, six months. Six months came, I said, I'll do a year. Six more months came, I said, I'll do another year. And it was the best time of my life. Um, I was, I would go to meetings every day. I would go twice a day. I had commitments. I made coffee at the brown bag. That's where I got sober, at the brown bag. And they're all, like, crazy. And they have bracelets on their feet. And they're all, like, getting things signed. And um, I made coffee at the mediator, Church of the Mediator, the Young People's Group. And this guy would always show up, and he was, oh, God, and he was homeless, and I don't know if he was an alcoholic, but he called me shorty, and he would have seizures, and I'm like, oh, my God, he's going to fall down the stairs. But the one thing about the guy that I picked up, he loved AA, and he lived in one of the halfway houses, and, man, he showed me the book, and they, and they would sit around like, they're really weird. But I, lo but I knew what he was saying was the truth, and so I started, you know, I, I got a group full of women. I got a sponsor, and, you know, I learned a lot about the fellowship of, of AA. 
but, you know, the fellowship of AA, I heard this, it's different than the fellowship of the spirit. And so it did, it lasted for a while. Um, I ended up getting married, having kids, going to college, doing all those things. And, the, and um, what I loved was, you know, that I could start getting free of me, you know, start losing that, that bondage of self. When I went to college, that was the first time self kind of reappeared. My grades, my tests, my class. My kids, my job, me, 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 my grade, my class. And it would just be over and over. i got to study for me, 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 me. And I would start saying things about my sponsees like, they're sucking the life out of me. And, um, you know, I, I could feel the shift. And that's where self kind of, of crept in. And I really had a hard time. Um, this past um, couple years ago, I started getting into some stuff. Emmett, Emmett Fox, a lot of his stuff, reading that. And I took it and some other things that are really new age kind of metaphysical, and this is just for me. But my interpretation was that, hey, I can create my own life. Man, I'll just change my thoughts, which is very contrary to what AA says, that you change your actions and your, your thoughts will, will then come. And so I started with this new age God. Didn't even really know it. I had no idea that I was edging God out. I had absolutely no idea. If you would have told me, I would have said you're crazy. Um, but it's really hard to do a third step. You know, being God's agent, God's employee, you know, when you're running the universe with your thoughts and creating all these situations, you know, it's a lot of work. And so what happened was, what happened was, um, I had something, you know, in my life, um, my husband and I went, wanted to have another child and, um, um, we waited and we waited and finally, you know, I got pregnant and I remember being in, um, going to the, the, um, the doctor and getting the ultrasound, and I remember him saying, you know, there's no heartbeat, and I was mortified. Now, would I create that? But in this God thing that I believed in, I thought I created this. I was like, how could I be so duped? Like, I didn't create this. This is a bunch of crap. Like, who would create this? If I'm, you know, and, and in that metaphysical stuff, it told me that I created, this. and I, I was horrified. And so I found myself in this situation, like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Where's my God? Like, what have I done here? And I continued to go to meetings, and and um, I started working these steps with a new sponsor and started, um, um, well, I, I had some very bad postpartum after we ended up d having another child, and then I had some postpartum that was pretty bad. I remember getting on 22, and I thought, the sun, man, it's not, doesn't have its luster, you know, like, what happened? And I remember those days, and I never want to go back there. And I went to the GYN, and he said, uh, I think you're clinically depressed. And I thought, oh, oh, no, 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 not me. And he said I should go on medication. I remember getting out to the car, and I thought, I am not. I just know what's happened here. I've lost my primary purpose because I got caught up in having the baby, and, and, and I'm having a little postpartum, and, um, and I've lost my God. That's my problem, buddy. I've been through this. I am not going back on medication. And so I said, and I walked out to the car with this bottle of pills, and I look up, and there's this huge rainbow. And some people might think, oh, that means to take the pills. For me, it was like, I know what that means. All I got to do is beef up my program, get right with God, and this is all going to come back. And so I joined this step study, and this newcomer said, he's going to run it. And he said, get rid of your big book. you got to get a fourth edition. And I thought, who is this? You know, it's like, that's what all my stuff is, but I couldn't see it anymore. You know, like I had to get rid of that one. And so I did this step study and we started and here I stood at, you know, at this turning point where, where's my God? And so now I have to go, um, just a little side thing. My, we had bought a house and my husband wanted this house. I don't want this house. Piece of junk, man. I had to redo all this stuff and I don't want to do that with kids, but it had a shed, a brand new shed. It had a John Deere tractor and had every power tool you can know. And my husband has enough. He wanted this house. We end up in this house in a school district that I don't like the school district. Now I'm thinking I have to send my kids, you know, to a private school like I went to when I was, a, you know, religious private school. And I'm like, great. And so now there's a priest there, and he's saying, in order to get the tuition, you have to come to church. And I thought, who is he? Like, but I'm motivated by money. That's a motivator. And I thought, what a jerk, you know. So I would go and stand in the back and put my little envelope in and leave. Some days I wouldn't even stay for the whole thing. And I thought, we started doing step two, and I thought, i got to go to that church, man. I got, and before that, we lost one of the other priests, and um, we got this other guy. I'm like, I don't know if I like him, but I'll talk to him because I, I hate this other guy. And so I said to my husband, I'm going to talk to him. I got this intuitive thought, and, and I'm telling him I don't believe. I don't believe in this anymore. I don't know what to do. I'm screwed up. Oh, my God, what do I do? My husband's like, 
oh my god, you're gonna you're gonna tell a priest this? And I'm like, yeah. And he's and I'm thinking they're gonna like have the garlic and the holy water and spritzing me down, you know. And he's like, you're gonna I'm like. I had to save my life here, and maybe he's going to give me what to do. I had no idea that this guy that they just moved in there had 23 years in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. had no idea. And I walked in there, and I said to him, I don't believe, man. I don't know what to do. I don't, I, I don't even know. I don't know where to start. And he said, it doesn't matter. He said, maybe this isn't for you. I was shocked. I was blown away. He said, wherever God wants you, he's going to take you there. Here I'm saying I'm going to be excommunicated. Everyone's going to know. And he, just him saying that to me, sparked something. Then I met with someone in the rooms, and I hope he's not in here now, but he was going to tell me his idea of God. And he told me, and it was very neuron-based and, and just this different perception. And we met in Barnes & Noble, and he was going to tell me, I needed to know. I'm in a bind here. He leans in, and he says, about your neurons or something. And I go, oh, what? I was shocked. Instantly, I walk out of there, Barnes & Noble, a free woman. I was free. At my it, my belief shot up like you wouldn't believe. And it wasn't a holy religious belief, but it shot up, man. I was alive. And I was like, yes, you would believe what he told me. This is great news because that is not what I believe. And so we started. <laughs> and I've been there, done it. It doesn't do anything. It didn't do anything for me. So we start the third step with my sponsor. She starts talking about volleyball. I came a volleyball. I will volley the ball to you. Your actions will show me if you want to play volleyball. There is a lot of people in AA that like to talk about playing volleyball. Do you want to play? Yeah, I want to play. So then we get on to the um, we get on to the part in the big book where it says God's agent, God's employee, God's child. She tells me the story about working for God and Corporation Earth, and do I want to be do I want to work for God or do I want to work for so and so? And I said, what? What do you mean? Like, what? I thought you just do this when you're doing the third step. You don't do this every day. Like, this is a very third step thing you do while you're working through the steps. Do you want to work for God? And I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah, I want to work for God, but can I have days off or a week? <laughs> no, you got to work for God. you got to be God's agent, God's employee. And so I went on from there in a very different light. And that changed everything. That means, and I said to God, I don't believe you're my father. I don't. I said, if you want to move that in me, you can. I said, but I don't really buy it right now. I don't believe that we all have a right to be here. I think I do, but I'm not sure about everyone else. And um, if you want to grow that or change that in me, then please do so. And, and, um, and he did. And I didn't have to really do anything for it. Um, and so what happened was... Um, as I started working for God and not myself, things started to unfold. And she would say things like to me like about my kids. My baby would be crying, and she would say, could you go help? Could you just go hold one of God's kids, one of God's babies one more time? Because he wouldn't sleep. The, God, the kid wouldn't sleep. I could do that. I could do that for God. I can't do that if they're my kids. If they're my kids, they've met their quota for the day. They're sucking the life out of me. You know, can you just do that for them? Absolutely, man. It's God's kids. And I could do it, and I'm free. And so what happened was there other things started appearing, these little opportunities. And when you're not just doing it for yourself and you're working for God all day, you have to look for opportunities to help other people. And so I, um, I'm at the gym, and I love the gym. And every time I walk by the, the trash can, there's a paper towel on the floor, and I thought, Oh, and that's you get this intuitive thought. And I said, no, I am not picking that up. God, that is disgusting. And I could hear it every time I walked by. What is wrong with these women? Why can't they meet the, the trash? That is just, this can't be part of the third step thing. And so every time I'd look at it and whatever. And finally, I'm like, I'll pick it up. And so I pick it up and I put it in. And I'm like, I hope nobody saw me because this is now, this is over the top. I'm not an evangelist here, God. I'm not going to save the world. And so I started doing this. And, and she would say things, well, maybe the woman, you know, is beaten by her husband and had had back surgery. Maybe you're helping this, this lady attendant who does this. And she's so sweet. And so then little things, other things started happening. And, and for my job, I, um, I have a profession and I go um, work with people in their houses and the newspaper is always on the front lawn and I am not a newspaper reader I don't buy it I don't care about it and I will not deliver it but every day I deliver the newspaper to at least five people it is guaranteed now part of my new job and 
Before it would be like, these darn people, why don't they get up out of bed and get this paper? I mean, do the, anyway. And so I can do that today and do these little things. And, and I can pick up the paper because I can make coffee, but I don't drink it. I can pick up the newspaper. I might not read it, but I can do it. And so, um, when, and, and so in getting in that spirit and doing that, you know, things have been just, miraculously different finding opportunities who can I help it's not about me you know I started with the the um, fourth step and um, I love the fourth step and some just heard me share this but you know column one I can't say the family member because I'm being taped but I resent her because every time I go there she says some religious figure is going to come and tonight and end the world and only certain people are going to heaven and everyone mostly is going to hell and that she will then go from that topic to that there are underground tunnels um, for nuclear stuff that's coming down the pipe and that they're putting stuff in our food. And she will go from one religious topic to another. She will show me one quilt, one Afghan, one thing to another. And I'm like, what about me? My kids, man, these are your, you know, like, come on. And she just keeps talking and she doesn't ask. And so, the, you know, those are the reasons that I resent her. And then I have to look out. Um, and she's also a bit overweight, so she can't help watching the kids. She never could, and she tells a lot about her health problems. And so I can be judgmental in the fact that, well, they wouldn't be this bad, you know, you gotta do something here. And so when I look at my third column, what does that affect? It affects my pocketbook. I'm burned up, man. She can't babysit. It affects my pride. She doesn't want to know about me. It affects my self-esteem. Like, is there something wrong with me? Um, my ambition. I don't want to go there if she's just going to talk about herself, man. I got to get mine here. And then I move over to the other side, you know, the final column, which is, you know, what, what part in self, you know, is it in me? And so, of course, I'm selfish. You know, I'm self-seeking. I want someone to look at me. I'm afraid. Um, and, you know, what I love is that that's my freedom. You know, I get to see what's me. She never did anything to me. You know, where it says it's fancied or real. She never did it. She loves me. She is so proud of me. Tells me about, talk, talks about me to all of our family members. She absolutely loves me. And so I, um, I sat with my sponsor. I did my fifth step, and it was, oh God, it was so horrible, horrifying. And she, um, it says now we have to take a different look here, and we have to look at somebody else's point of view. And she tried to paint a different picture, and, man, I wasn't buying I was like, oh, dear God, no, it couldn't be that way. And she started to point out things and, and to show me that if I was in that shoes, could I have done exactly the same thing? And absolutely, I could have. And there's that, that whole idea of looking at, you know, I have to get out of looking at it from the prosecuting attorney and look at it on the defense side. You know, i got to do that. i got to put me to rest here because I'm going to die, you know, if I don't. And... um and we did that, and I left there after seven hours, and um, I went home, and it says that, you know, we thank God for knowing us better, you know, for knowing him better, and we put the book on the shelf, and I don't even have a shelf, but I'm finding a shelf and taking stuff off, and my husband's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I've got to put the book on the shelf, and, and then it says we walk through an arch, and so I'm Googling, what's an arch, man? Is it a bird thing? Like, does it have, does it have like, greens, or is it, like, what the heck is it? It's like midnight, and I have to review this, and I have an hour, i got to do this, and and so I do exactly what it says, and I printed out my arch in which I walked a free man or woman. And, um, you know, it was so fantastic, but it, but then it got ugly because then I was on 6 and 7, and that's the part that I do the same thing with alcohol. I will never pick up a drink. I will not do it ever again, and I do that with my character defects. I will never, not today. And if you would tell me by the end of the day I could lie, cheat, steal, gossip, or whatever, I'd be like, no, not today, man. I'm working for God. I'm sparkling today. And by the end of the night, when I review, I'm like, oh, my God, how did this happen? Um, but I love that. It's that God removes only the ones that stand in my way of my usefulness. And we always laugh that I'm such a tool, I'm God's tool. And uh, I always get these little things that are just great, um, great reminders. So we start doing six and, and seven. And, you know, I'm hating, you know, the lady at the gym because she gets off the machine and she sweated it all up. It's disgusting. And she's on her cell phone and I've had to listen to this Jerry Springer crap while I'm trying to work out. She walks away and I'm hating her and I, and I hear God, you gotta wipe that machine. And I'm like, no way. I will not do that. She's gross and I'm watching her walk through the gym and I'm hating her. And finally I say, I'll do it when I'm done. On the machine, I will do it, God. She comes walking over. She goes, oh, this is so disgusting. I can't believe I did this. And she wipes it. 
the moment I said it her free in my mind, she freaking comes walking right over. It was absolutely amazing. Like, I've never seen God move like I've seen him um, move in that particular situation. And there's other times. I mean, the gym, I just love the gym because I've done it for years. And I get so many demonstrations. The one day this, this guy, I didn't like him. A lot of guys shave their legs at the gym, and they have hairy legs. And, and I just made a judgment about him, and he's playing his racquetball, and all of a sudden he falls back into the glass, and 18 feet of glass fall on him. And I go, oh, I'm not helping him. No. Here his legs are cut, and I'm like, oh, dear God. And so they're bringing over these little Band-Aids, and because it's my job, I have all of this stuff in my car that will take care of his needs. And I go, I'll be right back. And I run out, and I get it, and... You know, it's just that willingness to do this. That It's not just helping only alcoholics, you know. My life is full. My phone rings all the time. I have call times with women. My husband always says, when am I going to get a call time? You know, and it's been that way for years, and it's been fabulous, and it's really been great. Um, but I, you know, my biggest, the, the thing that, it, well, I'll get to the, my seventh, my eighth and ninth step. I made my list. You know, I have my list. She says, put it on index cards, person, place, phone number, address, and what you did and what you're going to say to them. And you carry that with you. And I thought, oh, my God, like, what about the list that you used to keep in your freaking dresser and, and like, look at it once in a while and think, think about it. No, you write their name and address, their phone number, everything. And I'm like, oh, dear God, what if someone sees these? I can't do this. And so I did. And I wrote the list. And, uh. On the list was a, um, I then got put in, um, I got sent to an area of town that I wouldn't, but because I was such a good employee, they sent me there to do some customer cleanup. And it was right next to the store that I used to, in my addiction, I would go in and steal. I would buy things and steal because you could, cigarettes weren't behind the counter at that time. And I thought, well, it was, uh, you know, I was born in a very racist household and they're not citizens. And I mean, it was horrible. It just, uh, it was terrible and, and I did it and, um, when I first got sober, I sent 20 bucks anonymously in an envelope. And, she, and so this came up on my eighth step, because I've done the steps a couple of times, came up and she said, oh, it came up again. It must mean something. And I'm driving by this store like twice a week. And I'm like, oh, my God. She said, let's calculate this out. How many years did you live there? And I said, uh, two or three. She said, well, how much did you steal every time you went? I said, about three bucks, probably back then. I don't know. She says, well, let's calculate that for two or three years and see what that $958? What? I gotta take, well, you stole it, didn't you? Yeah, but, I, what do you mean? I can't go, they're all end up on TV. And so, I didn't tell my husband, cause I don't. My husband will let me off the hook. I will not usually tell him to the last minute of something I'll do, because he gets me a little about it. And he will let me off the hook. And so I go there, well, a good friend of mine is here who went with me, and I call, and he agrees to meet me outside. I said, sir. And I even had these old timers. The 20th Amendment, don't do it. There's, I don't know, some amendment of the whatever, statute of limitations or whatever. Don't do it. Don't do it, man. And so she said, do you want to play volleyball? And I said, oh, my God, i got to go there. And I almost burned that relationship to the ground over this one, man. I was fired up. And I was going to go to jail and be on the news. And they were all going to see that I was just trying to be this do-gooder. And it was just going to be bad, the whole thing. And I have a profession to look out for. And so I go, I said, sir. And some people told me to say this crappity crap and not get to the point. I just said, listen, I'm here because I owe you money. I said, I stole, I bought and sold things. Oh, I remember you, he said. And I said, I said, and I'm in a program of recovery, and, I'm, and I, need to, I need to pay back the money. Oh, no, honey, you don't have to. Well, when I went to get the money, um, I went to two banks, and my disease says, $958. What, what does she know? You know, like, 920 is a good number. Like, why do you have to get these dollar bills? This is so over the top. Don't do it. I had found a $20 bill the day before, and I had $18 change because I bought something. It was in my wallet. Now, I never carry cash ever, ever, ever. I don't even know what's in there. I go to two banks, I get 500 out, I get 400 out of the other one. I tell my husband I'm going to do it. He says, honey, if you go to jail, just call me, I'll get you out. And he's laughing. <laughs> I get the money out, and I'm getting out the first 500, and I, I put it in, and all of a sudden I see the $18. And I'm like, oh, it's not my money. Like, I get it. This is God's money. Like, let's go. And so I took the money, put it in an envelope, sealed the envelope. And I said to him, I'm here, sir, to pay you back. No, no, you don't have to. I'm so glad you changed your life. Oh, you're welcome at my store any day. And I said, well, no, sir, I, I have to give you this money. And he's like, oh, you know, okay, I'll share with my employees. Now, he has no idea how much is in there. This was 
a year ago. He has no idea how much is in there. And, and, and you know, my husband had just got laid off. This was going to hurt a little bit, you know. And I take him, I hand him it, and I walk away, and I just leave. And, you know, my friend says, oh, how, do you feel better? Not really. I mean, I, I do, but I don't. And he, and he didn't open it, but I know he walked in the store because he came back out to look at us. And I go, let's get out of here now. And I am telling you, I have never had more financial success in this past year ever. I have never made as much money as I have made. It is remarkable the amount of money that I have made. The next day I got called into the office. Laura, do you want to make $60 an hour? And I go, what? I mean, or it's two days later, and I'm like, oh, my God, doing what? And, oh, yeah, we have this thing, and it's going to last a couple months, and will you do it? Please, we beg of you. And I'm like, oh, my God. All right. Um, before that, you know, and, and did it come right away? No, but afterwards, man, I was paying back a lot of people. You know what I mean? Like, I just, it meant so much more than what I, that one particular person. When I was in the hospital having my baby, um, I thought, you know, you know, we're packing up, getting ready to leave. I, I need an extra baby blanket. No, we have the money. I don't need any blankets. And so I uh, take the um, take one blanket, take an extra because it's sentimental, you know. And so I take, um, by the end of it, um, my disease says, they don't really pay you enough, you know. It's your insurance. It's not really that good. You should probably take another blanket, you know, like just in case you might need it. And so when I got home and I'm doing the eighth step, then later the ninth step, I look at these blankets, and I have six of them, and I am mortified because I work for the place, you know, and I have six of them, and I have to take the baby blankets back, um, and it was horrifying, and I had to stand in front of the hospital and tell them, blah, 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 and they said, you can't take your blankets because you took them from the hospital, so I donated them, but I have so many Ninth Step Amends stories that I can tell you, which have been just phenomenal, um, and, you know, the one that I love the most is, um, I went, I work with dying people and I went to this man's house and he was dying of alcoholism. He was 50 and he looked like he was pregnant because when you're dying, you get ascites and your liver fails and it starts to blow up your belly and it starts to squish on all your organs and you can't breathe. And he had these two very handsome strapping young sons in the military and they came home and, and they said to me, why isn't he saying he's sorry? And I got to share with them, you know, about the disease of alcoholism. And I'll never forget that. I said, because he can't, you know, he can't. Um, And that was a pretty, you know, remarkable experience for me. Um, And um, I went on to start doing the 10th step and 11th step. And before you know it, I'm doing this 10th step. The first day I try it, I'm angry at traffic. I'm like, how am I going to get any work done? You know, you want me to, it says when you, when something appears, it crops up, you take care of it right away. You tell God, you tell yourself, I mean, you tell someone else, and then you ask God to remove it, and you go help someone else. Chop wood, carry water. Do it. God, I'll never get anything done, you know, with all my stuff floating around some days. And so the first day I do it, by the end of the day, I'm telling you, people are letting me out in traffic. They're annoying me now. They are stopping to let me out. I mean, it's unrelated, but they're like, I, they're causing like traffic problems because the bus wants to let me out. Then over here they want to let me out. I don't know. God gives me these crazy little signs, and um, and I just love it. And I love these steps because you know the one slogan I love the most is you take the steps off the wall, you get an off the wall program. And I'm telling you, to be able to tap into that power, you know, like it says that we can recreate our lives, has been just phenomenal for me. It has transformed me every single time. There is no glass ceiling here. I can do this as much as I want. I mean, that to me is fantastic because you guys can say, hey, honey, you worked it once. You know, you, know, you screwed it up. Now get, get out. Um, and, you know, that's what I love about it. But that 10th step, that 11th step, you know, every, uh, upon awakening, I have to do that. I have to say, here, God, here's my plans. What do you want me to do? Because I know what I want to do. But it's so different when I can wake up and say, you know, God, what do you want me to do? And and to me, that is just amazing. Um, I was at one of my patient's house, and, and this, this will always stick out for me. This was recently, a few months ago. I was there, and she was dying of breast cancer. And I had tried to rally her, you know, like she's in her late 80s, and I want to help her, and I want to, I want to be a bright, you know, spot in her life, and 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 I want to try and lift her spirits, you know, because that's part of my job, and I can't, and she's not rallying at all. And um, I remember going there the one week, and there was this woman there with her. She looked this, my patient looked totally different. I'm telling you, she there were wrinkles that were not even there, were gone. And I'm looking at her. Her spirit is so light, and I'm looking at this. I go, oh, who are you? She goes, oh, this is my friend so-and-so. She comes here every day from 9 to 11 and helps me do whatever. She has lung cancer. And I thought, 
oh my God, I know what's going on here. I don't have lung cancer. You know, she has lung cancer, but I don't. That's why I can't rally her. That's what you guys do for me. You guys have alcoholism. You know, that's how I know that you guys have that depth and weight, that, that crap in the rehab or the psych wards or whatever. They didn't have it. They didn't have it to give to me. And so, you know, I, I love, I, I just, to see that work in, in some other way was just amazing to me. Um, I got to do a 12 step call recently with a lady. Um, we were at St. Luke's hospital and, uh, they had picked her up. The police had picked her up and she was face down and she had a big, you know, I don't know. She was black and blue and her hair standing on end and, and she'd been not, you know, sober, I guess for a day or two. And so we went there and was talking to her and she's like half, you know, cocked and like, and I tell her my bottom, like, yeah, I used to check the blinds and all this and that. She goes, Oh my God. And I go, yeah, they just found you face down and she thinks I'm nuts, you know? It was so hilarious. Like, her hair is like a peacock, but, you know, she she just thinks I'm nuts. Um, the one time I was doing, uh, on New Year's Eve, I did step work with someone, one, two, and three, and I said, so, you want to work for God? And I'm thinking, she's going to balk. She's going to balk. She goes, oh, yeah. And I go, what? You know, like, who does that right off the bat? Not me. i got to think about it. i got to think if this is going to be good for me and how much suffering really, what does door number one really look like? You know, it can't look that bad. And so I get home, and it was New Year's Eve, and it was warm, unseasonably warm. This was this year. And we're walking, and I'm looking at my husband. I go, he's pretty cute. I go, look at, look at these kids, man. Those are my kids. Like, they're cute as can be. I can't believe these are my kids. And I go, like the way my husband walks and I'm telling you it is because of doing service other days I'm like you know my husband this my husband that he drinks butter when we make clams I don't get this this is wrong but I'm loving him because that's what service does it changes the way I see things it rearranges it doesn't I'm telling you problems disappear and I love the women you know in my life I had this other newcomer the other day and I'm like yeah, I want you to read one, two, and three or whatever. I said, she goes, oh, yeah, I read to page 93. Really? You believe in God? Oh, yeah. What? Like, who? I, I don't get it. You have how many days? Oh, yeah, man, I believe. And I'm like, great. Um, and then the next day when she called, she goes, I can't talk. I have to go find my dog. I go, you live at a halfway house. It's not your dog. And she goes, well, i got to go find her. I can't. And I'm thinking, do you know who you're talking to here? Like, this is our time. Like, you're going to go find a dog that's not even yours. So I love it. I love how newcomers keep me right-sized. I love um, how this program just keeps, you know, directing me in, in the way that I'm supposed to go and giving me, um, you know, you know, giving me the little things, showing, you know, where does, where does, I love that part, where does God hide? Exact, you know, it's like that game of peekaboo with mom and the baby. God hides, exa- you know, where the mom hides exactly where the baby can find her. And God hid behind that priest that I hated. God hid behind this crazy guy in, in, in Barnes and & Nobles. And, I mean, all over the place, God hides in the, the chair of the meeting, at, you know, that gets me to make coffee. And, um, you know, that's where God hides. You know, and most times I'm like, this shouldn't be, this shouldn't be, you know, this just shouldn't be. And um, I owe, and I'll stop with this. I always know how good I'm doing by how much I like all of you. And the one day I go to my favorite big book meeting on a Friday night, and I'm looking around the room, and I'm like, I don't like any of them. There's like two people I like, and it's because they don't share. And there was this guy, there was this guy on oxygen. He was on oxygen, and I'm looking at him going, I think he's faking it. And I'm, and because of my profession, I'm counting his respiration. And I'm like, and now we got to hear this. You know, thing. And I hated them all. And I knew the week before I did a, did a lot of overtime at work, and I knew that I was working for myself. I always know who I'm working for by the end of the day. If I'm working for God or if I'm working for myself. Because if I'm working for God, it's very clear. I can tell you a million things and opportunities and how I've seen God, you know, in my life. If I'm working for myself, I'm miserable and I hate all of you. And, um, and, you know, the miraculous thing is I know the truth. You know, I know the truth today and I know who my employer is today and sometimes I fall off, but I never knew. I thought you only did the 10th and 11th step when you were on 10 and 11. I thought you only do the third step when you were on the third step. We don't want to overdo it. And I love that part where it says the spiritual life is not a theory. Well, me thinking about wanting to do it doesn't count. I have to actually do it. And for me, that has been something that has 
um, that's hard for me to do because I just want to do I want to do it sometimes, but I want all the rewards, you know. And I can tell you, every single um, promise has come true really for me. And, and I'm telling you, it, it's, it's just been really amazing. And the last thing I'll share is something I heard at a uh, I don't know I think it's a big book study, and the guy said his sponsor was dying, and uh, I think it was Bob D who said it. And he said his sponsor was dying, and he said to his sponsor, "What will I do when you're gone?" The sponsor said. I have been bringing you um, hands full of water. Now go to the river. And for me, when I heard that, I was like, and that's what AA is. That's what God is, the river. You know, I got to go out there and I got to give this away because I know it. I keep nothing if I don't give it away. And I'm not saying I have great to give away. It's usually pretty funny and wacky. But it, I know that that is what I, how I keep what I have. And this then, anyway, I think I'm out of time, but I could talk forever. Um, so thank you so much for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.